Next on Hispanic Agenda, the DC region makes the list of the top 50 most dangerous places for pedestrians. But if you're African-American or Latino, the chances of getting hit by a car nearly double. Plus, back to school, how for the first time ever, minorities will be the majority in US public schools. That and more coming up on Hispanic Agenda. Hello and welcome to Hispanic Agenda, Washington's only bilingual news program. I'm Alejandro Negron, thank you for watching. On the agenda today, every year, anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 pedestrian fatalities are reported nationwide. If you're black or Latino pedestrian, the chances of being killed in a collision with a motorist nearly doubles. What's behind the disparity? Jeanette Reyes has more. Well, Alejandro, Montgomery County is one of several counties in Maryland currently working to address what can often be a deadly relationship between pedestrians and cars. Officials tell me they have concentrated efforts that are aimed at the Hispanic community, and here's why. Neri Ramos acknowledges here in Montgomery County it's common to see jaywalkers, something that's leading to numerous pedestrian accidents. So far this year, there have been 17 in the county. Seven were fatal. Three of those were Hispanic victims. Well, I'm not really surprised about it because sometimes back in, um, you know, Latin American countries, uh, People are not used to the laws and regulations of pedestrians. Jorge Salgado says he's all too familiar with impatient pedestrians, especially among Latinos, including many of his family members. We were in Las Vegas and on the strip, and the strip is six lanes, you know. That's like everybody, you know, we're going to go down the street, we're going to use a crosswalk, and then, you know, that's what we do. So I turn around, where do I see my grandma and dad and lady like going for it? I'm like, oh my God. Blanca Kling, spokesperson for the Montgomery County Police Department, says law enforcement is working to educate pedestrians with a special focus on the Latino community where many Hispanics tend to walk rather than drive. What role do you think cultural uh, differences or, or culture plays? It plays an immense role uh, because we are ingrained, we are educated that way. We, Since we were little, we are, uh, learned uh, really to cross the street whatever we want. Nearby Prince George's County recently made the top 10 list for counties with the most fatalities at 15 for every 10,000 people. They've had five fatal accidents this year. Sobering numbers like these are forcing local law enforcement to ramp up their efforts to address the problem. Uh, at Montgomery County, soon official. Kling says that you may find undercover police monitoring intersections anywhere and at any time, ready and willing to ticket pedestrians for breaking the law. Salgado says a little common sense could easily save you the money and possibly your life. You should be smart enough to know that you're not gonna be the car. You know, if he hates you, you're gonna you, you're gonna get injured. And those undercover officers will also ticket drivers that don't stop for pedestrians when they're supposed to. So definitely there's a cultural aspect. There is. This. There is. It's one of several, yeah. But what are the, some of the other uh, reasons why African Americans and Latinos uh, tend to uh, die at a higher rate in, in involved in these uh, collisions? We also have economic issues, and you can't ignore that. You have a lot of Hispanics and, and, and African Americans uh, more than, than any other race that are more likely to be walking, taking the bus, that kind of thing. And so that's why you'll see those numbers a lot higher, directly kind of linking those two together. Yeah, the poverty rate really does track the death rate of of, of pedestrians, mm -hmm. and of course, that's one of the reasons why African Americans and Latinos, I exactly. guess, are, are dying at a higher rate mm -hmm. uh, than the rest. But uh, you just have to do what your mom told you to do. Right, right. Look and both ways. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And one thing, um, and of course, you can't ignore that drivers a lot. You have a lot of a lot more distracted drivers nowadays. Sure. But then, in terms of that higher number with Hispanics and and Latinos and African Americans, um, one example I like to use is when you go to the Dominican Republic, for example. There's a lot of, you know, there's not, it's not as regulated and you mm -hmm. don't have that fear of being ticketed. Here they're taking it very seriously sure. and, and even more seriously in recent, recent years because of these numbers. All right. Thank you so much. Jeanette Reyes. Coming up, the tragic death by suicide of comedian and actor Robin Williams is bringing new attention to the issue of mental health, something Latino culture is largely prejudiced against. A straightforward conversation with the roundtable on the issue next.
Welcome back to the Hispanic Agenda. Let me welcome this week's roundtable, ABC 7's Hatzel Vela, Maryland State Delegate Ana Sol Gutierrez, and Radio El Sol's Pedro Biaggi are here. Thank you for being here. A lot has been discussed this week on the issue of mental health, probably the only fortunate event to come about Robin Williams' tragic death, as well as that of the other 40,000 Americans that die every year by committing suicide. But an estimated 29 Latino mental health professionals for every 100,000 Hispanics, and with machismo not permitting a real man to talk about his feelings, it's time to bring this issue to the forefront. So let's Start this way, our roundtable this week. Welcome all. Uh, Ana Sol Gutierrez, I was speaking to you uh, off the air. And you recently came from an event that had to do with mental health and Latinos. And you were telling me some stories that uh, really shocked me. Uh, absolutely, Alejandro. Uh, uh, I was very fortunate to be a speaker at a new group uh, under NAMI in Montgomery County that's brought together uh, service providers around mental health for Latinos. And there's some critical issues, not only the language, but also this cultural misunderstanding. And the case that I, I mentioned was shocking uh, that a young man, 15 years old, um, was hearing voices. Uh, in his community, his parents uh, brought him to church and they thought that he was gifted, that he was a religious uh, voyeur. And uh, when he finally went for treatment and they, they discovered he was a schizophrenic, uh, the shock was so big for the, the young man who thought he was special mm. that he committed suicide. That is so sad. It, it, it is tragic and it does reflect our lack of understanding, our lack of acceptance that mental health is just as critical as having diabetes or having another illness. We treat it differently. We don't want to talk about, yo no soy loco, you know, we're right. I'm not crazy. <laughs> Uh, right. So and this, and this machismo culture, uh, uh, Pedro, also has a lot to do with it. We're not supposed to express our feelings. Right. And when I talk about machismo, uh, you know, not only men suffer from machismo, right. only, uh, also women, you know, sometimes may tell it's the denial. husband, get yeah. the pasa. Right. You so know, what's wrong with you? Right, You're supposed right. to be a man. Come on, get up. Yeah. Well, as a member of uh, this beautiful society of show business and funny people, mm -hmm. I also uh, have depression. I live with that. Every morning I have to take a pill when I get up. Gladly, uh, and therefore I am always encendido. <laughs> right. you know? But it, it's a reality in my life. I was raped when I was a four-year-old boy. I, you know, my, my brother was shot four times when he was 22. My mother passed away in a horrible way. My father. I think I have enough traumas or issues that I could just sit there and yeah, cry you for qualify. hours. Yeah. I qualify. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, so I'm not ashamed to admit it mm -hmm. because it's what makes me a better person. Yeah. But I think uh, that also the problem is that we don't have enough providers and we don't have enough services that are cultural appropriate but we don't have enough people like Pedro coming out uh, exactly. and saying listen That's true. I, I suffer true. depression and yeah. there's nothing wrong with that uh, yeah. and you know I talked to a psychiatrist earlier this week about Robin Williams and she deals specifically with entertainers and one of the things that she said was sad about this is that here you have a famous person with plenty of resources who wasn't able to get as yes. much help as he needed so it's not just a cultural thing it's also a resources mm -hmm. and the ability to stand forward and say this I need help well, and, the and I think that's what makes it really difficult when society really looks uh, down on you w when you talk about being depressed or when you report having some type of mental yeah. issue it, we don't respond well to that well, we don't respond well to that and, and how very difficult it is a problem I think that's the message from uh, Robin Williams I mean a man who I I is he's beloved by everybody Absolutely. but to have that tragedy in inside him and unable to overcome it, even though he had mm -hmm. help, I think that really puts a, a because highlight. It's not a decision that he made to be depressed. It's a, it's a condition that's yeah, in his it's body. It's a chemical sure. disbalance, and we have to accept that it's not drama. Some people are depressed because somebody died or they lost their job, and they're entitled to be depressed. Yeah. But when it goes beyond that, when Absolutely. it you know when it's your your, your body uh, gives your you sense. the chemicals are upside down when you're happy in one side and sad in the other, then you it's have a to disease. go for the help. It's and a, disease, a disease, disease, and basically you're looking at life through some very blurry glasses yes. uh, yeah. and you can't see what's yeah. really happening and probably that's why <laughs> someone like Robin Williams who you would think has everything uh, is he successful. had everything yeah. five Grammys uh, yeah. Oscar everything but in that day yeah. in that day he that he committed so he didn't have it yeah. yeah. he was too yeah. the good news I think is that we are maturing as a society and and stepping up to doing more uh, Montgomery County and Maryland now has established a, a state program to mm. give grants to encourage the service providers to be able to, to do more so right. uh, I think uh, Virginia deeds with his son and the tragic yeah. yes 
efforts there. I think we're seeing uh, an effort. We're seeing an effort, we're seeing a change, and we're going to do a lot more on this show to cover this issue uh, as well. All right, we're going to have more with the roundtable coming up. Uh, for the first time ever, minorities will be the new majority in the country's public schools. The roundtable weighs in next, and a little bit about immigration as well. We'll talk, get a little bit about immigration in there. Welcome back to Hispanic Agenda, ABC 7's Hot Selvela, Maryland State Delegate, Ana Sol Gutierrez, and Pedro Villagi from El Sol Radio are, are still here as we turn the conversation towards the changing face of America. The National Center for Education Statistics reports that minority students, when added together, will now make up the majority of those enrolled in our public schools, although non Hispanic white students are still expected to be the largest racial group, representing about 49.8% of the students enrolled. We've seen this, uh, we've been talking about it actually, I think last year for the first time, Montgomery County became majority oh. uh, minority. Uh, so this is happening all over America now. Absolutely, uh, and I think it was even uh, before last year. We saw the, t the, the trend even when I served on the school board from 90 to 98, and um, you could predict it. You, all you need to do is count kindergarten sure. uh, students because uh, one in every four uh, students entering kindergarten in the nation is a Latino. I mean, if you ignore these numbers, and I say it's the number stupid, right. which is the mm -hmm. way that we should be looking at, uh, at developing public policy because it's so important for us to serve the student that is coming to our doors. And uh, there was resistance in Montgomery County. Uh, we had a famous uh, reporter say that the minute that Montgomery County became majority minority, that we would have the white flight, that the middle class white community would no longer send their kids to Montgomery County. That isn't true. Apparently they were wrong. It, it, it was absolutely wrong. It's time for them to go, yes. them to go now before we arrived. <laughs> well, the thing is that you absolutely need the support from the middle class. And so you when we're talking about the support, supporting these uh, kids, what are we talking about? What, what do they need? Right. Well, le especially early on, what you, you have is a child that's speaking Spanish at home. Mm -hmm. They're learning English. They're learning English and they can defend themselves quite well, but their English is very limited in vocabulary. So if you compare a child coming into kindergarten with two college-educated English-speaking parents mm -hmm. and a Latino coming speaking Spanish pr uh, primarily, uh, their their vocabularies are extremely different, and so their ability to learn to read uh, to uh, uh, learn concepts uh, are very different. But I've always felt that we do a lot to help the kids learn the language. We don't. But we, they're going to learn the language. But we don't do what's what called about the academic language. But what about helping the, the parents? <laughs> but, but, the, but the parents really are are the ones that need to learn the, the yeah, language so better, they can help the kids with their homework. It's better if you can do that, uh, but we also want to strengthen language development e in any language. Mm -hmm. You can learn uh, concepts in your own language, but you need to also be able to be preparing yourself for what's going to be in class. And our ESOL classes, our pullout, our disasters, it's an old uh, uh, faded model that was used when Cubans came to uh, Florida for the first time. It's minimal, it's mm -hmm. dumbed down courses, we need real infusion, we need bilingual, we need dual language. We know that when you build both languages, your brain cells are are growing at a faster rate than I anything I, I, else. As a student coming into the United States when I was 12, that's when our, our family moved here. Mm -hmm. um, and in, I went to an ESL class for about four months. I felt segregated. Well, you I are. Fe I, I felt like I was, you know, why are they segregating? Yeah, well, uh, well, you I mean, were. And my brother stayed in, in ESL classes all the way through high school. I got out of them. And he had difficulty later uh, with the language. Yeah, I mean, ESL I still have issues with the language <laughs> myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone watching the show knows that. This uh, is force still. the education system to step it up, step it up for those kids that need the special, the extra hmm. mile of education yeah. in order to match up with the language. And the faster you do it, the earlier you do it, the more you yes. enrich the language not dumb it down, mm -hmm. the better results you are. But we need major reform in ESL. And, uh, and, and Hetzel, it's also important, this is going to be the future workforce. I was just going to say that, you know, we have to look at it carefully because these are the people who are going to go to college and are going to be working in our neighborhoods making mm -hmm. a difference. So yeah, yeah. you have to start, like you said, you have to start early. The yeah. future president, Hispanic. 
He must learn English very well <laughs> from early ages. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get a Hispanic that will learn, <laughs> will, will know English once he gets it away. Unfortunately, and I, I work at, at uh, with Naleo, I'm yeah. chair of a task force that focuses on Latino students. As a nation, we have not stepped up to really understanding what it is that we have to do to make a huge difference. Our Latino students are are, are second rate. They're right, one closing quick the gap. Last question for Juana okay. Sola. I know you're working a lot with uh, with immigration. Uh, do you think the president is going to uh, act on some type of executive order uh, for the undocumented? He better. Before the he better. He better. He better. It's time. <laughs> it, people are suffering. He better act. He knows. Or Ana Sol is going to come after. We're going to go after. We're going to go after. Knocking on the, on the door. Yes. Right. <laughs> Coming up, Maria Rodriguez, executive director of the Maryland Hispanic Business Conference, is here to talk business, Latinos in business, and about an event that you don't want to miss. Next. Welcome back to Hispanic Agenda. My next guest believes that Hispanic business is the future economic engine for the state of Maryland. Maria Rodriguez is, after all, the executive director of the Hispanic Business Conference, an event that every year attracts thousands of Latinos and friends of the Latino business community. Maria, welcome to the program. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you for inviting us. All right, so let's talk about this wonderful event, which I have the pleasure to be the MC of it. Yes, uh, uh, we are very again. delighted. Yes, the, for the second year in a row that yes. you will be emceeing our event. Well, I, I love the event. I, I get to see thousands of people uh, every year there uh, meet with with business owners. Uh, we have the information on screen at the moment. It's Tuesday, September the 2nd at the Bethesda North Marriott Hotel and Conference Center. Really great event. Tell me about the event. It's a fantastic event and I think it's a great opportunity for new businesses, new business owners, or if you're interested in how do I start a business? Where sure. do I go? What connection? Where are the networking? This is the perfect place to meet all of our sponsors, exhibitors, our panelists mm -hmm. for the seminars to get that all that great information that can help you get started in a business or to bring your business to the next level. It's a fantastic event. So definitely when you start a business, you, you, there's certain things you need to know, of, of course. But it seems like one of the most important things is who you know. Exactly. You know, how connected you are. And these events really provide a great opportunity for networking, for, the for meeting networking, the folks yes. that make decisions and, and, and buying decisions. And, and guiding you the right way, like um, who can I connect with to make my business work? Mm -hmm. Or this person can help me sell, can help me promote. So sure. it's a great opportunity. The event is fantastic. This is the 13th year that mm -hmm. we're doing the event and it's always yielded a large crowd right. and a lot of information has gotten from those events. Uh, one of the things that I really like about this year is that uh, you guys are doing something new. Yes, uh, we're Now you're inviting everyone. It's free admission. Uh, tell me about that. Yes, the free admission is to the exhibit hall. Okay. So everyone will be able to come in for free walk around and meet all our great sponsors like Maryland Business Economic, Department of Economic, TD Bank. These are our top sponsors. Everybody's listed on our website. And you're able to talk to these sponsors and these exhibitors, let's not forget about our small exhibitors, which are business owners that are bringing their product, their information of how to um, promote, uh, what can I offer, and to reach to the Latino market, which is the main purpose of our business conference. And everyone should stop by, even if it's just to, to get a a, a bite uh, to eat from some of the exhibitors, some of the best food. Yes. Uh, you're going to find it there as, as and well. And trinkets. You can get great pencils and um, little notebooks. I mean, the exhibitors bring some great stuff that they give out and the information that they're giving out. Getting that business card, that contact is what's going to help you move forward. Now, tell me a little bit about the, the workshops that you're going to be having uh, this year. What am I going to be able to learn as a business owner if I attend the conference? We have eight workshops. Okay. The workshops are divided. The conference is all day. So beginning from 8 in the morning, we have a nice beautiful breakfast where we recognize and we have some speakers that are available there. All information is on our website. Sure. And after our breakfast, we go to the breakout room where we have four workshops in the morning. One of the workshops this year that is new, uh, seminar number one, is Hispanic Veteran Procurement. It's time. Okay. We got some great representatives there that are veterans that have started their own business. And they're going to talk about 
how they got there, mm. what you need to do, and um, give information, inside information, where people can say, wow, that's a great idea, I didn't think about that. Becoming an 8A, things like that. Okay. The second part of the workshops are done in the afternoon, four in the afternoon, after the luncheon. At the luncheon, uh, we have our speakers, we also recognize our three tops award, which we have our winners already chosen, All right. Latina Powerhouse, the Dream Award, and Negocio del Año, the Business of the Year. So it's fantastic. We're going to be um, awarding these um, uh, candidates that have won, yeah. and the, I'm not going to reveal anything. You re you have to be there. <laughs> you have to be there, and it's coming up. If people want more information, they can always go to the website. What is yes? That? Our website is www.mdhbc. Dot com, which is the initials of the conference, Maryland Hispanic Business Conference. And for business owners who are watching the program uh, at the moment and want to sponsor uh, the event, what number should they call? Um, there are great sponsoring opportunities, and you can call 301-947-6819. That's 301-947-6819. And the information is right there on your screen, Tuesday, September 2nd from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. at the Bethesda North Marriott Hotel and Conference Center. Great event. For more information, go to mdhbc.com. Maria, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. All right. Don't forget that Hispanic Agenda every week covers a mix of stories and issues as diverse as the Hispanic population itself. Catch the Spanish version of this program on Telemundo Washington, and be sure to join us again next week here on News Channel 8. I'm Alejandro Negron. We'll see you next time.